The morning proved beautiful, and one of the finest days succeeded that I ever remember to have seen. Our route lay through alternate woods and prairies, the former composed of large pines and cedars. Several considerable streams of water were passed, whose banks were not so high as those before met with, the latter covered with strawberries, so tempting as to induce us to dismount and feast upon them. After passing extensive camas plains, we reached the company's farm on the Cowlitz, which occupies an extensive prairie on the banks of that river. They have here six or seven hundred acres enclosed and under cultivation, with several large granaries, a large farmhouse, and numerous outbuildings to accommodate the dairy, workmen, cattle, and company. The grounds appear well prepared and were covered with a luxuriant crop of wheat. At the farther end of the prairie was to be seen a settlement, with its orchards and company, and between the trees the chapel and parsonage of the Catholic mission gave an air of civilization to the whole. We were kindly received by Mr. Forrest, the superintendent, who quickly made arrangements for canoes to carry us down the Calais and Columbia River to Astoria, or Fort George. The guide that Mr. Forrest had sent for was one Simon Plamondon, whom I engaged to carry us to Astoria. He had been for several years in this territory, having left the company service, married an Indian wife, and was now living on a farm of about fifty acres at the Cowlitz, independent and contented. Plamondon engaged several of the young Indians to accompany him, and with two canoes we were all accommodated. The price for each Indian was to be a check shirt. About a mile from the farmhouse we descended a steep bank, two hundred feet high to the river, where we found our canoes waiting for us. The Calitz was here about two hundred yards wide, and very rapid. Our company, or rather crew, consisted of nine young Indians. We were soon seated and gliding down the stream, while each boatman exerted his full strength to send us onward. Just before sunset, when we thought we had made nine miles, we landed and pitched our tents on a small island in the river. At the place where we embarked, I tried the velocity of the stream, which I found three miles per hour, but in some places it was much more rapid. The temperature of its water was 48 degrees Fahrenheit. The next morning we made a start betimes in order to reach Astoria at an early hour. A short distance below our encampment we passed the east fork of the Kellis, which is smaller and not navigable even for canoes. We also passed the mouths of several small streams on the west side. Plamondon pointed out that side of the river to me as good trapping ground and amused me by the narration of many of the difficulties he had to encounter in taking his game. About noon we reached the Columbia. On our way, we met with many canoes passing up, loaded with salmon and trout, which had been taken at the Willamette Falls, in which they were then carrying to trade with the Indians for camas root. We obtained some of the fish as a supply for our Indians. The Kellis River takes its rise in the Cascade Range, near Mount Rainier, and has many short turns in it. Its banks are tolerably high, until it approaches the Columbia. It is only at high water, in the spring and fall, that the river can be used for boating, at which time the supplies from Vancouver are sent, and the grain and company returned in large flat barges. The soil along the river appears to be of a good quality, a clayey loam with vegetable mold over trap rock and sandstone. The prevalent trees were poplars, soft maples, ash, fir, pine, and cedar, with some laurel, where the prairies are so low as to be flooded in the month of May. On this river it was reported that coal of a good quality existed, but I examined all the places that indicated it, and only found lignite. This exists in several places, but the largest quantity lies above the East Fork. Several specimens of it were obtained. In the month of September following, I examined the callus and found it exhibiting a very different character. A few miles above its mouth there was not water enough to float even a boat, and it was besides filled with rapids. It is not navigable for barges more than three months in the year. The distance we passed down the Kellis did not exceed 26 miles, although we had been told it was more than 40. The route by the way of the Kellis will in all probability be that which will hereafter be pursued to the northern waters and sounds. Although there are many difficulties in crossing the rivers in company, yet it is believed to be the most feasible course. 